Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday morning live painting session. Good to see you all. Hope you're doing well. And uh, this is our regular Wednesday morning live painting session. And we're going to continue on with the uh, painting we did last week, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Painting we started last week. Um, so I hope you're all well. Morning Terry in Las Vegas. We're happy you're back as well. Morning Gail in Wyoming. Marie, welcome in New Hampshire. Morning Sajada in Nevada. Morning Peter in New Zealand. Welcome. Morning Manju in Ontario. Um, just while we're giving people time to um, to catch up. I started this painting yesterday for um, the Paint the Impressionists. This is a uh, William Merritt Chase landscape painting. So I started painting that one for Paint the Impressionists yesterday, hoping to finish it today. Um, if not, it'll be next week because I'm going away. So that's an exciting little project if you're in the Paint the Impressionist uh, full program. And on our advanced, which will resume next week, we've been painting the Tully River. Um, and we've done two sessions on this and probably another two to go, I'd say. And uh, our members are doing a good job posting up their versions of this. So well done, everyone. But for today, where are we? We are doing this painting of Capity Valley. We started it last week. Um, so that's exciting. Morning, Jenny in Williamstown. And another Jenny. Good morning. Where are we up to here? Morning Rosalie, morning Yvonne in WA, morning Steve in Bell River, Ontario, g'day Joan in Ireland, morning Carleen in Cabo San Lucas, well there's a place I haven't heard of, morning Nina in San Diego, morning Evelyn in Arizona, morning Barb in the Mornington Peninsula, and g'day Colin, how are you, morning Jenny on the Gold Coast, good morning Audrey, good morning Linda, g'day Tracy, all right, well, yeah, so we started on this last week. We did the drawing and the block in. I've noticed a couple of little drawing errors in my drawing, which I'll talk you through. Um, and today we're going to finish this one off as a little demo. Um, and uh, this is the Capity Valley, which is in New South Wales, Australia. Morning, Joanne in Ni Niagara. Morning, Wanda. Uh, yeah, Capity Valley in uh, New South Wales. It's west of the Blue Mountains. Keep going west, young man. And um, you'll find it there. Beautiful part of the world. If you're in Australia, or even if you're not, put it on your bucket list. Um, highly recommend it. Where am I? I'm all over the place this morning. Cool. Coming down to our palette. Same palette we normally always use. Um, ultramarine blue. Lizard and Crimson Yellow Ochre, three base colours. Boost colour, Cadmium Yellow Light, and I'm probably going to add a little touch of Viridian. And of course, Titanium White is going to be our, uh, our white there. So we'll get underway. It's a good little painting, this one. Um, it's a good one to have a go at. And... Uh, you know, we just followed some very basic principles um, of good painting, right? So one thing I notice is I'm always going on about big shapes, right? Because I think that that's the most important thing to get the painting started, right? And I've got this tree, see where I've terminated it down here? And it really was to sit up on the ridge there. So that's something we'll have to adjust. I also have my mountain probably just slightly in the wrong spot. I've moved it over slightly. A few little things like that. Um, so... What we'll do, we'll start off with this main tree, we'll build that up, then into these trees, then back, and then um, we'll see what happens from there, I guess. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> Fingers crossed. G'day Robert in Ireland, and Diane on the Gold Coast. Morning Foxy. All right, mushroom cupper at the ready. Now just looking at this main tree here, it's mostly in shadow tone. Um, it's a 
you know, to shadow, it's a dark greeny shadow. I've gone for more of a pure shadow. So we'll put in the dark green as a middle value. And then there's just a couple of little spots where it's clipping some light, but it's not that bright a light. Um, so we don't want to overdo that. I'll mix my greens around about there. So we want, as a starting point, just to build up those middle values. Now, once I start working on my painting, I'm not going to refer to the photo that much. I'm not going to be a slave to the photo. I'm going to work out what does my painting need and what's feeling right in the actual painting itself. Because at the end of the day, that's what people will see. They won't see the photo. Okay. So I can push this green a little bit darker. It's just ultramarine blue and yellow ochre, pinhead of the red, lizard, but I'll just push it a little bit bluer and darker. And we'll see what happens, right? Take a big brush. No point mucking around with a small brush on a big tree. Now let me just have a close look at the photo. Alright. Fingers crossed. <laughs> So load, see how I'm loading the brush just with the tip? Okay, I don't want to load all the way down to here. Um, that won't help. Okay. So you can see that's fairly dark. It's probably a little bit lighter than the shadow tone that we've already got up there. And I want to leave some of that shadow tone coming through, especially down in this lower area in here. So I'll, actually I'll mix that shadow tone again and pop that in. Close up that area there a little. Okay. So you can see that my background mountain is the wrong value. It's, um, it's too dark. There needs to be more contrast there. If you have a look at the photo, you can see there's a lot more contrast. So let's just have a quick look at that. We might as well get these things clear in our head at the start, right? So, too dark still. It's deceptive what you mix on the palette versus what it's going to look like against everything else in your painting. Okay, that's too grey. Too much of the red and the yellow in there. This is going to be too dark. I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, that's better. See how there's greater contrast there now to the um, background mountain versus the middle tone of the tree. Now, why am I doing this? I'm doing it really just to check against my tree. I want this tree to come forward. So I need, I just want to get the value a bit more accurate. Um, for the background there. It's not how I'd normally approach it. It's just what I felt I needed to do this morning. It's probably a bit more like that, isn't it? For this particular painting, right? Also going to make that tree stand out a bit better. Okay. Now I know I need to reshape that background mountain. I'm just getting the value in at this stage. Okay. So now I'll get a bit of better feel for this tree here. And it also gives me a bit of wet paint just to soften back into here and there. Okay, but I will bring out my darkest dark. Um, I could probably just use that green there, but I'll take the, the blue and the red. Okay, as you can see it's gone pretty dark. That green on the knife's already got yellow ochre in it. Okay. So, well, I should probably not grab another brush. Um, let's just build up 
looking at the darks in here. And because all this paint's, you know, that I'm putting in is nice and wet, I can soften it back in. Except for when it's dry, the dry parts. So that tree's looking better already. Starting to take shape. Um, a little bit premature to be doing branches and things, but I just thought I'd get a feel for it. And then, okay, so where is the light going to be um, clipping on this? Um, so there my dark brushes, right? Where's the light clipping? It's clipping just in there and a little bit across there. Let's just focus on that, right? So that's my darker green. And what I could do is just take a tiny bit of that and just push that green a lot lighter and brighter. Don't have a mix it. Now, the pigmentation on this cadmium yellow is not as good as I'd like. So you're gonna use a bit more of it. And then I'll take a tree painting brush See this one here? It's my tree painting brush. See how the hairs are all sprayed out? Okay. What I'll do is I'll just scoop up that colour like so, a big chunk of that paint. And let's just imagine there's light catching in through here, right? It's fairly chunky paint. What I can do is then just pull all the paint off my brush, nice dry clean brush, and then in the underneath there, we'll just start to soften that back into that middle value there. And because it's my tree painting brush, it's, um, it's gonna give me some nice sort of random effects. Okay. Now we'll come back to that, all that paint's fairly wet, so I'll soften that in a little bit more. I'll just give it a chance to just set off a bit. Too easy. All right, I'm gonna come across this tree here. I'm just gonna just walk across the camera, sorry about that. I'm just gonna bring in my other camera here. It might make it easier to show you that side of things. And so we're going to use a similar sort of um, approach, right? We're going to use the same approach sort of over there. So. All right. Um, so we'll just have a look at the photo. So the photos, there's a lot more light on over the other side there. But we need to get that middle tone in. However, what I'll do is I'll lighten that middle tone because it is in a lot more light. Okay, so there we go. Add a bit of sunlight into it with the yellow ochre. Okay. And I don't have a printout of my photo, I have to really fix that. Um, so let's just start to build that up there, right? So I've got a tree behind, we've got a tree in front. We'll just start to build that up. So the light's coming in this way. I was gonna put on that other camera, wasn't I? Three, two, Sorry about that. I really need a camera operator. However, we're going okay. Okay, so, so this is the middle of value. Okay, a little bit brighter than the middle value I put over on this side because it's catching more light coming in. However, that was the dark I mixed up before for the main tree. 
I'll just come in and next to it and I'll just get a slightly different dark, slightly lighter, okay, slightly cooler. So that's our first dark of the tree. This is our dark for in here. And I'll just start to push that back up underneath that foliage there so that we maintain a feeling of shadow and light. If I just obliterate all the darks with the middle value or the highlight value, then we start to lose the feeling of shadow and light and form, right? I think that's working okay. And I can now take a little touch more of the yellow, a little bit of the cadmium yellow light. Let me come back to here. Okay, so I've just on the side here, that's the green that I just use as a middle value. Now I'm lightening it up. Okay, get a little touch of white into it. Okay, so it's not the same light that we use on the main tree. It's just slightly different. Okay, and I'm just going to... I've got to be careful here because I've got wet paint. And um, I'm going to pick that wet paint up and potentially dirty it up. The brush. bit more of that dark. Okay. Just starting to get a feeling of form there, right? So now we'll come back into this tree here and we know we can't use the same dark. Um, so we'll just go a bit lighter. Oh, it's probably a little bit too light. Okay, so then we will take, that was our middle value there, I oh, know it was more that one, wasn't it? And we'll just lighten that off a bit, but we'll also just add, cool it back with a little bit of blue into it. See how it's a different shade of green there? And all I'm doing is I'm just using the principles of aerial perspective. All right, as things go back in the distance, they lighten in value. There's a general principle, of course. They lighten in value. They, um, they lighten in value. Come on, brain, engage. They lighten, <laughs> lighten in value. Uh, they get cooler in temperature, and they become less saturated, which is what I did there. I lightened the value, I cooled the temperature, and it's a little bit grayer. Just adjusting the value of that background mountain range there. It's probably still not quite right. In fact, I wonder whether it should just be a little bit darker blue. Something like that. Bring that tree down a little.
this is a good painting to have a go at. You know, you learn a lot about basic principles of landscape painting. So I highly recommend it. Okay, now we'll just re-establish the darks of these trees here, which, um, and reposition them. Let's take a dark here. How's that looking? That's probably a little bit gray. So this tree here now is going to sit on that ridge and it's probably a little bit bigger than that. It's going to sit on that ridge there. Okay, that one there, we'll just make that one less significant. And then this one here, does that terminate? Oh, you're right in the middle of the road really, isn't it? Okay, so we're just going to downplay the importance of this tree as well. Well, it does create a nice vertical going across the mountain range there. Okay, there's a couple of other little bits and pieces in there, but we'll just give a light indication of those. All right. That leads us then to the field, but what we'll do, we'll just pause for a few secs. Uh, have you got any questions? Feel free to type them in. And we'll happily answer them for you. Ba -dum, ba -dum. Um, just while you're typing in your questions, I'm just going to bring up um, the photo so I can have a closer look at it. There we go. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to type them in about what we've done so far. Somebody's doing an angry face. Why would you be doing an angry face? Hello in uh, Athens, Greece. Welcome. G'day, Mel. All right. Anybody have any questions about where we're up to? Do -do 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 -do. Um, mum, mum. Or we just push on. I know there's a bit of a delay, I should have given you a bit more warning. Would you put the sign in or leave it out? Probably leave it out, I think, Rosalie. I don't know that it really adds much to it. Uh, Heather says, hey Rod, I'm just about done with your colour theory course. Good on you, Heather. With the distant hills, if they are closer and greener, do you still do you use still paint the undercoat blue? Well, it depends on whether you know the distance. So, as things get further and further away, um, yellow drops out of the colour spectrum, and then red, and that's why we end up with bluish mountains, right? So it really depends on just how close they are to you. Um, like in this photo, it's pretty evident that the the mountain ranges are bluey grey. Uh, but it really depends on the subject that you're painting there, Heather, as to how close the distant hills are and, and the lighting effects and the atmospheric effects. Um, but it's a good general rule of thumb. If you're painting landscape and you want to put mountains that look like they're in the distance, then cool them down by making them bluish, bluish grey. Um, so... Uh, and g'day Anne in Ireland. Why do you use red brown on underpainting for grass area? Uh, well, first of all, because greens can be really tricky to um, to pull off, and uh, 
there's so many varieties of greens, but the ready tone, red is the complement of green. We need some sort of base tone there, right? So um, in step two of the more method of painting, what we're really doing is putting down the shadow underpaint, the undertone, um, and then we put a middle tone over that and then highlights. So, um, you know, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna put down an underpainting, which is representing the shadow side of it, or what's under the grass, then if we just put more green and then layer green over that, then it becomes difficult. Um, so I've found that if I use a red color uh, to complement a green, it makes all my greens a bit more vibrant. But also, you know, so that's one reason. The other reason is Australia does have a lot of red uh, sort of earth as well, and this is an Australian scene. Um, so that's the other reason. Um, so it's sort of, a, and I don't like pure red, so that's why I push it sort of orangey brown and make it a bit of a dirty colour rather than a clean, saturated colour. So I hope that helps, um, Anne. Thank you for joining us in Ireland. Linda says, love your tree painting brush. Need one of those? You're just going to wear out one of your good brushes. That's all you need to do, Linda. <laughs> um... Hello Rod, having a hard time making live streams since time change here. Not to worry, Janet, we put all the recordings into the uh, live stream course. Gary says, a bit of an escarpment. Yeah, there is a bit, but you know, uh, this is really just a basic level demo. I don't know how much we'll get into those sort of details in the back, but feel free, obviously, to put it into yours, uh, Gary. Um, could someone spell out the name of this valley? Capity, C-A-P-E-R. T double E, cap T. What type of dress are you using for the trees? Um, what type of dress? I'm not sure what you mean there, Nina. Um, push on, says Terry. <laughs> All right. Let's push on. Uh, yeah, sorry, Nina. Don't understand what you mean by what type of dress. Do you mean brush? Because if you mean brush, then it's just a flat brush that's been worn out, <laughs> basically. Okay, we're going to get a green hill in here, greens in here, partly green, partly something else in there, right? So, we'll just take this. Um, okay, I know you didn't see that, so let me start again. We're going to put greens up on the back hill, greens all the way through here and in here. And then it's more of a sort of a yellowy tone in through there. So push on and I'm going to mix up a, um, a more vibrant sort of green for in the back. A little touch of yellow ochre into that. Too much yellow ochre. Lighten that off. Okay, as things move into the background distance, they get lighter in value. So therefore, we um, are wise to have some lighter version of our greens. And get some punchier greens in there as well. So I spread that paint out too thin and I'm having trouble picking it up.
runs down about through there, doesn't it? No, it runs down through there. More like that. Okay, so this is where we come in here and we can now start to reshape tree trunks and things. Now, not having the photo reference in front of me, and I can only just see it on the monitor, but it's incredibly small. So um, I'm just going to paint the green fields as I kind of feel that they work with the painting here, as opposed to trying to get it exact to the photo. So if it looks different from the photo, now you know why, because I'm not looking at it. Just using the photo just as a general starting point. Let's get my printer fixed so I can print things out again. Okay. Um, I will introduce, if I can find my paints. Somebody's nicked my bucket of paints. Well, seeing as I'm the only one here, it's bound to have been me, right? <laughs> Excuse me for one second while I hunt them down. Okay. So our green fields need to be lighter in value overall than our tree greens because our tree greens are verticals and they naturally get less light than our um, flat planes, which are the fields, right? So I'll just put a touch of the phthalo green into it and that'll give us significantly, it's probably a little bit premature, right? Oh no, that'll be okay. Um, that'll just give me a little bit more punch in these greens as we come forward. I don't want that phthalo green though, of course, in the background. That would be um, a mistake. <laughs> That'd be like, a, oh, whoops. Didn't want that there because it's so vibrant that it will pull forward. Just keep varying your green, maybe even a little pinhead of red here and there. Otherwise these greens are just going to look all a bit too similar. Break up the line of that shadow there. A little bit more of a darker green just in there.
Okay, and then in here it's kind of a mm, kind of a brackeny feel. I'll add a little bit more red and yellow into it. I'll lighten it back a bit. Mix the greens into it. Hope for the best. Now I'm, you know, I'm really generalizing with the colors here and the shapes. There's obviously a lot of little color shifts and things in there, which if you were to examine the photo carefully, you'd pick up on those. And um, obviously it's your choice as to how far you want to take that. And I'm painting this very broadly. Uh, what I mean is, I'm just using a big brush, putting down very broad sort of brush marks. I'm not going for any detail at all. Because it's just a quick demo, right? Um, what happens around these shadows in here? There's a little bit of this green light coming through. But it does lend itself as a good subject to um, do a large, or maybe not necessarily larger, but a more considered, more detailed version of, um, if you wanted to. Certainly one that's been on my radar for quite some time to do as a more complete painting. But the idea of these Wednesday, um, Wednesday live streams is just to give you the sort of basics Get too dark up there, Rod. Okay. So notice no details at all just yet, right? We're coming right at the end and we'll put in a few tree trunks and a few fence posts, and that'll be our details. Let's get into the sky. What's happening in the sky? Let's just I'll bring up my photo for a second so I can have a closer look. I don't think there's anything happening in the sky. Um, pretty bland, grey blue sky, very light in value, right? So that shouldn't be too hard for us to figure out. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, bluey grey sky, bluey grey, bluey grey sky. So how you describe it is how you mix it, all right? It's a light bluey grey. Basically the same mix I've got up there for the mountain. Just touch more blue into that. That should do the trick. Don't have a lot of sky there unless I remove the tape and I choose to paint paint out the top, which I doubt will do because um, I think the orientation works well. So that's a nice clean colour. So I'll need a, I'd be wise to have a nice clean brush. This is a bit of a cheapy, um, but it will work. Scoop up the paint, and again, you know, using these background colours, we have the opportunity to shape things like mountains and trees. Okay, I don't want a hard edge there, so I will come in and soften that. And I'm using thick paint, whereas where we do our blocking, I'm using thinner paint, but I don't intend painting over this sky mix. So therefore I want the paint to be thick. Uh. As a general rule of thumb with oils, not so much with acrylics, but when you're painting in your darks, which are generally more transparent, um, you want to have your paint a little bit thinner. And then when you're painting in 
your more opaque colours, which tend to have more white in them. And typically are using thicker paint. It's a good rule of thumb. And um, will help you to work with oil or water mixable oils better. Doesn't matter with, a, with gouache, you know, gouache will dry real quick and pretty much the same with acrylics as well. Okay, it looks a bit better shaped than what I had from last week, which is um, a bit pointy. Okay, and I don't really want to have hard edges in that sky, so I'll just clean my brush out. And um, pull it through the paper towel and along this edge of the mountain there. I'm just going to blur it up. Maybe not for that featured sort of part there. I'll leave that a little bit. Harsher. Not harsher, harder. Okay, probably want a little bit of highlight on those background. Trees there. Less contrast, right, than what we've got up here. Because they're further away and we don't want to drag our attention to them. So I'm sort of dragging that into the sky. Paint there. <laughs> and they should just sit there nicely. Um, oh, we'll do the path. Because the path is quite a light turn. A light turn. Mostly sort of yellowy pink. Yellowy pink with a bit of blue. Bit of that blue. Touch more red. These shadow tones are going to need adjusting. Um, a bit too black. A bit 
too dark and heavy. I do need to just darken it up a little bit in the foreground. Darken it and warming it, right? Because warm colors come forward, cool colors go back. Warm colors come forward, cool colors go back. How did we learn when we were in primary school? Six sevens are 53, eight nines are 210. Two in the times tables, wasn't it? Um, as you can see, I wasn't very good at school. <laughs> Oops. Um, but yeah, warm colours will bring things forward. The cool colours will take things back. So we use that to our advantage. Because all painting is an optical illusion. And the illusion is we're capturing a sense of three dimensions in a two-dimensional surface. Which is just mind-blowing when you think about it that you can actually do a painting on a two-dimensional surface that has an absolute feeling of depth. Have you ever thought about that? If not, it's worth thinking about. Now, it took me a long time to grasp that concept, but you know, when I first got, got it, when I first really sort of understood it, I was watching a DVD, that's how I learnt to paint, was from DVDs. I was watching a DVD by the Australian artist, Robert Wade, who's getting on in age these days. Um, but a brilliant watercolour artist. And I remember watching him paint an English, sort of like a Tudor-style house. Had these attic windows. And he... Um, I was looking, you know, a bit flat and a bit dull and a bit boring. Not not boring, but um, the magic hadn't hadn't happened at that point. Put it that way. And um, all of a sudden, he put the shadow on the side of the attic window, and the whole thing just popped into three dimensions. And I was just like, wow! It blew my mind. And that's when I realised that it's all an illusion. Painting. It's all an illusion. because we effectively are creating a feeling of depth and dimension and volume and atmosphere on a flat surface. <laughs> and if you can pull off the illusion, people will come from miles around, tell you you're so lucky to be a natural gifted talent and painter. And, um, They'll marvel at your genius and the gift you were born with. You and I are no different, of course. It was hard work that got us there. Um, I'm still waiting for that to happen for me, but um, we'll get there eventually. Still doing my apprenticeship. Just trying to find a... Normally I don't use these many brushes, but to try and keep things a little bit efficient on the live stream. I you know, keep changing brushes so I don't have to clean them properly. Um, a bit of a shift in value in the sky. And it probably wants just a little touch of warmth in the lower part of the sky as well because it's a little bit dull. All right, we're going to pause in just a moment for a few minutes. If you have questions about, not general questions, questions about the painting process so far and where we're up to with this painting. Or, you know, if it's about the more method of painting and how it relates to this painting. I just want you to keep in mind, this is just a quick little demo um, to try and convey the basic principles. If I was doing this as a more finished painting, then 
I'd um, be taking a lot more time with certain parts of it. So if you have a question, type it in. I shall endeavour to answer it for you, but I can't promise an intelligent answer, but we'll definitely give it a try. <laughs> okay. There we go. That's probably slightly better. Should I turn for there? So again, I've done no details at all. But what we've been focused on is getting the shapes right in the right place with the right values and then the right uh, colors. Okay. So, what did you lighten your shadows with? I just used the dark green rather than, a, you know, the shadow I had in there originally was sort of bordering on black. So I just mix up a dark green and that was slightly lighter in value um, than the dark, you know, almost black. So that's what I, was, I used to lighten it there. Robert Wade's now 91, well there you go. Brilliant, brilliant painter. Um, why do you not have hard edges? Well, I do, I do use hard edges, but things that are often the... So the thing we have to keep in mind, hard edges draw attention, so they draw the viewer's focus into the painting. Um, so things that are way off in the distance, if you want to... Um, um, if you want to make things look like they're further away, then they need to have softer edges, generally speaking. Um, you missed what I picked up, it was just a dark green, so it was ultramarine blue, um, yellow ochre and a bit of alizarin crimson in it, uh, Jenny. Just the three basic primaries um, that I use. Okay. Let's scoot back here. G'day, David. Just sitting back enjoying your magic after a long day of work, sipping on some espresso. Nice. Uh, going to pick up my brush and continue on the fundamentals. Uh, good on you, Dave. That's great, mate. Um, Carolyn said, this, I think this is a great subject for a painting. As always, you are great teach, you're teaching great principles. Love this. Oh, good on you, Carolyn. Yeah, I think it's a great one that everyone should have a go at, even if you don't particularly like the subject. But it, it, to get that feel of you being drawn into the painting like that, it'll help you with every other painting you do. Dave said, speaking of... Dave, I, um, I don't use traditional oils anymore. I'm using water mixable oils because of I don't like the toxic solvents um, that traditional oils have. And so um, I switched to water mixable oils and that's what I'd recommend because I thin my paint down with water. Um, and uh, I find that far more beneficial for health purposes, right? So I, I wouldn't recommend any solvent for traditional oils because I think they damage your health. So water mixable oils, almost identical. But um, Carolyn says, if the sky was all the way to the top of the canvas, would the mountain range look further away? Uh, yeah, possibly it would, yeah. But because it's a fairly dull, flat sky, you know, if I did extend, you know, if I took the tape off and extended it, then I'm going to have to do something with the sky to make it a bit more interesting. Um, but I like the orientation of this. This is the way the photo was taken, and I, and I probably wouldn't extend the sky up. Um, if I thought it was a painting worth framing, then I'd just cut it off the stretcher bars and mount it to a board of the right size. Um, Dave said, I found that using Murphy's oil to clear your brushes work. Okay, I don't know Murphy's oil. Carolyn said, it looks fantastic. Heather says, it's really hard. Which bit, Heather? Step by step, it's easy, come on. <laughs> Tracy said, when you say you'd take more time, which parts? The, the whole lot, Tracy. You know, I'm trying to condense this painting down into two one-hour sessions, so... Um, I would just be more relaxed about the process. Like I'm in this sort of like live stream format, I'm trying to really um, keep the pace going, um, which is not necessarily the ideal way to paint. In our advanced live streams, and I made the decision when I started doing the advanced live streams on Thursdays, that I was gonna paint paintings that I wanted to sell, like that were of a quality that I could sell. 
and therefore, you know, if it, if it takes eight, ten hours to complete them, then that's what we'll be doing on the advanced live streams, spread out over time, right? Um, so, but in these Wednesday ones, which I want to keep simpler, um, easier for beginners to follow, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make decisions about simplifying things right down and, and keep the pace going a little bit quicker. Gary says, I have an issue with being a bit intimidated with bright colours and tend to mute dull them. How can I overcome this? Uh, well, I think it's just understanding the principles, Gary, that you know, highly saturated colours are in the front and then highly desaturated are in the back. Um, and you know, when you lay colour down, you're seeing it relative to whatever else is on the canvas and it can look wrong when you first put it down. So you just got to train your brain to start to understand if I put down really vibrant, saturated colours um, that are out of context with what else is on the canvas, just, you just got to know that they won't look so vibrant as we start to build up the rest of the painting. They'll, they'll start to uh, fit in. But look, what's the worst that can happen? You put down really vibrant colours and then later on you decide they're not right, so you grab your palette knife and scrape it off and, and re readjust, right? Um, didn't Renoir say on his dying bed, I think I finally got it? <laughs> he may have said that, but I'm not sure it was about painting, uh, Jenny. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, cheers, Vicky. Thank you, Jenny. Do you think using distilled water makes a difference? Uh, never used distilled water, so I can't comment on that, W. Lynn. Um, Debbie says she's the opposite of Gary. She prefers to use muted colours, and I think that's what you mean. Um, not now, but at some stage, could you explain how to restretch the canvas? Just came to mind as you. Uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily restretch this one. I'd probably get a bit of MDF board cut to the right size, and then I'd cut the canvas off and I'd glue it to the board, and then I'd stick it in a frame. Um, th this one is not going to go in a frame, though. It's, uh, it's not going to be of the right quality, but that's what I'd do. In terms of how do you, how do you take loose canvas, and stretcher bars, and how do you stretch a canvas? Yeah, I could probably, I probably should do that as an art studio chat video at some stage. So maybe in December, um, I uh, I will get around to doing that. Uh, okay, let us push on. Um, let us push on. So now, just a, a quick update. Tomorrow, <coughs> we're doing our webinar for those interested in starting your own art teaching business um, and the more certified instructor program. So that will be at 9 a.m. my time tomorrow. If you've registered for that, I'll be sending out the link details um, in about half an hour's time after we finish this live stream today. So look out for that if you've registered for it. If you haven't registered for that webinar and you are interested in um, potentially joining the more certified instructor program, um, and you want to join us for the webinar tomorrow, then contact our support desk um, and let them know and they'll give you the link to register and the link for the live stream tomorrow. So that's tomorrow. Um, Friday, we won't be doing a coffee chat. Sue and I are heading back to 1770, which is kind of our little holiday destination spot um, for four or five days. And then we'll be back in time for next Wednesday's live stream and we'll start something brand new. Um, but yeah, Sue and I are gonna get away for a couple of days. So no Friday coffee chat this week. And remember to always check the event calendar on the Learn to Paint Academy website for updates on events, um, what's coming up and what's happening. All right, there's just a few little details that I would do to this, you know, for, for today's purposes. Um, and there's a couple of different ways I might do them. I might use a palette knife and just scrounge up some leftover paint here and Definitely find my glasses, that's very important. <laughs> Can't see a thing. Um, the only problem with glasses as a painter, a messy painter, is that you get paint all over your glasses. Okay. So, to in, in an effort to avoid getting too perfect with my um, branches and things, I'd scratch them in with a palette knife, like so. Might be worth having a few that are bit more on the lighter side as well. Get a bit of highlight on them. Okay. However, that's not the only way to do it. You could also use a script liner brush. Okay. You always want to get a little bit of um, 
you know, we want to thin it down a little bit with a script liner. A little bit more challenging while the paint's fairly wet with the script liner, but certainly doable. You don't want big solid tree trunks going up because that's not how trees are. You know, you're going to see bits and pieces of the tree trunk and then overlapping foliage. So we just do little bits and pieces of, of it. Some of it shadowier tones and some of it more in light. And we don't overdo it. So we know when to stop, like about now. <laughs> okay. It's got a little bit messy in there. You know, often with a, with a painting I'm trying to finish as a, you know, a saleable painting, often I'll get to a certain point where I know it's sort of messy in there, and then I'll just wait a day, let it tack off overnight, um, get fairly dry, and then I'll just come in and I'll just tidy up around any parts that need tidying up. Tightening and tidying is kind of like that last 1% important one percent to finish off a painting Make sure it doesn't look pasted on, so just sort of tap it all in to get it to sit better there. Overlap some of the grasses over the shadows. Okay, now these ones that are a bit further away, we just go a little bit lighter. Yeah, I've made that too big and I'll just tap a bit of green over it just to reduce its impact. Okay. Now there's a lot of details you could do. You could come in here, I think Gary pointed out before that there's a little bit of an escarpment feel in here. So you could do that, but you've got to keep the values tight. Um, so that's, I think that was our tone there. So to get the right we have to mix back into the mountain colour and um, keep the value quite tight. There's going to be hardly any contrast there, right? So you could. The problem is you don't want it to have too much of an impact so that it, you don't want it to be the feature that draws the eye to it. That's too, too much in there now. It's more of a green, actually. It's not really a rocky escarpment colour. If I'd mixed the tone right, then that would have 
been what I would have done for the escarpment. Now I'm going to have to fix that error. I'll tell you the easiest way to fix that. Just to scrape that back a bit. So I didn't mix the right tone, I mixed it too green. Shape those trees a bit, pull the mountain back into them there. Now I've made the top of this mountain just a little bit bigger than what it is in proportion to everything else just so it's a little bit more of a highlight there a little bit more of a feature of the painting all right now for memory there are some fence posts Run out of paper towel. Hang on for one sec. Where they go. Okay, now when they get into the shadows there, of course, we want to be able to see them a little bit. So I'll just pop a little bit of highlight on them. Too much because we don't want it to. Jump out too much. And look, there's possibly going to be Tiny little bit of shadow in there. All right. Well. Gonna leave it there. A little demo. I think it's demonstrated the uh, 
tips of the more method of painting, how to go about constructing a painting, um, and plenty about the um, you know, basic principles of landscape painting and getting. So I've got a good dry clean brush just while I'm rambling on. Um, you know the basic principles of landscape painting and creating atmosphere and depth. Okay, so what I'm doing now, this is all just dried off a little bit, just softening underneath some areas where I might have got a bit clumpy. Push out a little bit more foliage up into that sky. Definitely don't create a mess while the sky paint's wet there. Just get a few of those little wispy bits in there. And there we go. Capity Valley. Should I take the tape off? No. Nah. I think I'll leave it like that. Last minute questions. Um, thank you, Sajada. Are you going to take photos for your reference during your getaway? Yeah, I usually do, Gail. I usually do. Thank you, Gail. The other Gail. Thank you, Debbie. Um, thanks, Tracy. Colin said, listening and watching you paint so amazing while painting my memories of the hilly landscapes west of Lithgow. Fantastic. Good on you, Colin. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Linda says, ooh, 1770, one of my favourite paintings. Thank you. Yes, we shall have a good time. Good on you, Sharon. Linda says, great demo, learned a lot. Thank you for another excellent session. Do you enjoy your time away at Sue? We shall indeed. Thank you very much, Linda. Let's have a look about the tape, says Steve. Stupendous, says Dave. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you, Manju. Thank you, Sajada. Um, Take the tape off. It's not going to look right, obviously, because it's going to have a whole lot of white, which is going to relative to everything else. But um, let me see if I can take it off without getting paint everywhere. And then I'll pop it back up. As I said, if, I, if you wanted to extend it into the sky, the, the sky, you're going to have to make the sky a little bit more interesting than what it is in the photo. So I think the orientation is much better that way for this particular scene. Because remember originally, I'd actually done this one in Learn to Paint TV, an older episode, and I did paint it up here, but of course I, everything moved up and it just didn't look right. So that's why I wanted to have another go at it in this session. Um, Bob says, thank you, Rod, trying to catch up. Good on you, Bob. Jenny says, thanks, Rod, I'll have a go at this later. Fantastic, Jenny. Robert says, well, I think the blue colour of the tape is a lovely colour, <coughs> blue with the clouds. Yeah, it did seem to work. Um, um, Heather says, in the colour theory course, you mentioned an artist who mixes up his warm and cool greys before he starts. This would be helpful for us new painters. Uh, that's a personal choice, I think, Heather. Some artists do. I don't. I mix as I go. Um, I can't remember who the artist was because that course, you know, I did about five years ago, I think. So I'd have to go back and listen to it. Um, you know, it's a personal choice. You don't need to. Um, one, there is one artist, Scott, someone or other, uh, Christensen. He, he pre-mixes every colour. And, you know, his DVDs are boring because you've got to wait an hour while he mixes his colour first before he starts. Um, that's not a criticism, he's a great painter, far superior painter to I. However, from an entertainment point of view, it's a bit boring. Um, yes, yeah, so that's personal choice. Work, figure out what works for you in that regard and, and just stick with that. As you know, having been to a couple of workshops and being a member, you'll know that I just mix as I go. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Evelyn. <coughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Love Learn to Paint, good on you, Yvonne. Thank you, Mary, appreciate that. 
Nina says, love to watch you paint. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your time away. Thank you, Nina. Um, yeah, so just as a reminder, no Friday coffee chat. And um, tomorrow at our usual starting time, 9 a.m., we'll be doing our MCI More Certified Instructor webinar. Um, for those who are interested in getting started and um, setting themselves up for 2022, um, then uh, you'll want to join us on that. If you haven't registered, then contact our support desk for the registration info. Um, if you have registered, then in about half an hour, 45 minutes time from now, I'll be sending out the link and everything um, on how to join us for the live webinar tomorrow. So no, 